Uh, once again, uh, welcome back uh, to another edition of the um, uh, special one. So, you know, today's program, uh, we have Dr. Ismaila um, uh, Sise. Uh, this is the second edition. The last edition, it was uh, Mr. Mohamed Jagana. And today is Dr. Ismaila Sise on the um, special one. So, Doctor, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, doctor, a um, lot of people heard about Dr. Ismaila Sise. Um, of recent, and then a uh, lot of people uh, want to know who uh, Dr. Ismail Asisa is. Well, thank you, and uh, good morning, and um, welcome you to this tranquil area yeah. of the Gambia, very quiet. Indeed. Uh, who is Ismail Asisa? Well, <laughs> 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 I've been asked that question uh, many times. Yeah. Uh, Ismail Asisa is not a very, not a very complex person. He's a uh, Gambian with very humble beginnings, born in Brikama did my primary schooling in Brikama. Born in a very uh, humble family. My mother was a school teacher um, for decades. My father was a local forestry officer who helped build the Nambai forest and other forests in the Gambia. They were the first people who worked at the forestry department. Okay. Um, did my primary school in Brikama and then sat to my common entrance. Um, and then I went to Sierra Leone to do my high schooling. I went to Alvar Academy. Okay. High school, where I did from one to from five. Upon completion, well, I came back to the Gambia, um, tried to get some work, but at that time it was difficult. There was no university, mm -hmm. and like most of my contemporaries at that time, what was the norm was mm -hmm. to travel. So it was then that I traveled to Sweden, um, lived there, worked there, studied there, and then I went to Scotland to further my studies, did my master's and my PhD. But in between, I've been coming to the Gambia. I've mm -hmm. still maintained links with the Gambia. I remember when I finished my master's in 2009 was when I came back to the University of the Gambia okay. um, and started teaching there. I taught for two years. Then I went back to Scotland to do my PhD, still maintaining the links, coming once in a while to teach. Okay. Um, and then now I'm a senior lecturer of political science at the University of the Gambia. I'm also the director of the master's program in, uh, in international relations and diplomacy. Um, yes, that's, that's just all about me. Okay, but you've also got um, Swedish citizenship? Yes, 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 because I lived in Sweden for many years. Okay. So obviously I'm a, I'm a Swedish citizen as well. How does it feel like? Well, like most people who live in diaspora, most of these citizenships we got acquired is out of necessity, not out of pure, pure, pure patriotism, not okay. out of uh, that, that, that bond, that national bond that's with, like with that. that country. Okay. Um, Gambia is still our maternal and paternal home. Yeah. Africa is still where you know, our umbilical cord was buried. This is where we, we love and cherish. This is where we want to live. Um, out of nature, you have to recall um, the, with the, that the context around that time. It was very difficult to make ends meet in this country, especially yeah. as a young person who has just finished high school. There are no prospects for a job. There was no university. Okay. Most of us were forced to travel overseas to search for greener pastures. Okay. And sometimes you have to acquire the citizenship, it makes it easy for the travel, it makes it for the integration to the society. Okay. And it also helped me to get access to Swedish education. But okay. I mean, I, my home is Gambia and I'm Your Gambia. Home is Gambia. All right, um, um, looking at education that time and now, um, how does it look like? Well, it has changed dramatically. Yeah. It has really, the quality has plummeted okay. over the past years. I remember during our time of the common entrance system, you go primary one to six at a common entrance, which was capped over 400. The pass mark at that time was, it depends. To get to high school was 240, 245. Mm. And, um, and then the quality was good. They go from one to from five, then lower six, upper six. Okay. But then recently, the, the change of the whole system to okay. so the grade yeah. system wasn't done with um, proper care. With, it wasn't considered properly. Okay. And you have to understand also that the things have changed. Before we didn't have any morning shift, afternoon shift. We had only one shift, only and in the afternoon shift, we just go for extra studies. Extra studies exactly. And also, um, uh, many things have changed in terms of, the, the qu I mean, the quality has dropped. And also, what we've also observed, especially in the higher education sector, is that there's a huge gap between high uh, the grade grade 12 Look, and university. Grade 12 university, and yeah. then university. So that those who come straight from grade 12 to university, they struggle with university because when that system was created, university there was no university, so it was in catered for. So I think because of so many complex um, factors has really, there is no one factor. I mean, one is the lack of investment, mm -hmm. obviously in the education sector for many years, especially the lack of investment in the teacher training. 
okay. institution like Gambia College, they didn't invest properly because if you have to train the trainers, I mean those who train the teachers to go and teach must be well equipped for the job, they must be ready for the job. Mm. That is one. And secondly, I mean, I don't want to start uh, saying exactly because there is no empirical evidence to say we need to okay. really have an empiric to do uh, carry out a research to say why has it, in fact we first need to establish empirically okay. that the quality has plummeted. Once that is established empirically, then we can know why. We go to the why question. Okay. Why? Okay. Why has it plummeted? And how can we intervene? Okay. Once we do that and we have the empirical evidence, it's easy for us to reform the whole education sector okay. to make it fit for purpose. But as we speak, it is not fit for purpose. It is not preparing Gambians to transform their lives, let okay. alone transform their countries. Okay. Uh, so uh, you've just uh, said that there is a, a huge gap between uh, the grade 12 and the university. As a senior lecturer at the university, um, how are you people working uh, to make sure that that gap is, you know, at least? Well, we are doing our best, but you know, you cannot compromise standards at the university. Okay. We understand, uh, you know, you have to understand university is a mix of different people from different backgrounds. Yeah. In one class, you'll have 300 students. These 300, each and everyone is unique. Um, some are senior, some are w professionals, professionals working in departments, managing directors. Some are 18 year olds who just finished um, grade 12, comes yeah. straight to university. Mm -hmm. Some have left schooling for many, many years and are coming and back. So you get a mix of a mix very of different people yeah. who are very unique in their own way. How you handle this mix uh, of people, it, it, it can be a very delicate task exactly. as, as, as a lecturer. But what the most important thing is we maintain standards. We don't compromise standards. We understand obviously the different peculiarities of all okay. this, but we maintain standards. And we do our best to ensure that those who are just coming in from university, we give them the proper induction they need to appreciate university education, which is very different okay. from high school education. Right. So yeah. we are pumped at university, you might be given only one chapter three for the whole semester at university, uh, sorry, at grade 12. Grade but, 12 uh, yeah. but high school is a very different ball game. It's, it's a very different universe. That is the they call it a university. university yeah. um, so when they come, most of them struggle from at the beginning. But obviously, Gambians, what I've observed over the years working at university is that Gambians are very, very resistant. They adapt to change and they, they are very hardworking. And whatever they want, they go for it, okay. even though they struggle. Okay. Um, despite, yeah, we are facing many challenges at the university. Okay. But I mean, we are doing what we can to ensure that we prepare new generation of Gambians. Okay. And so when, when did you start uh, teaching at the university? I first, uh, when I finished my master's in 2009 at Edinburgh University, I had a dilemma, it was a dilemma as to what should I do? Should I stay in Europe and work or should I go back to the Gambia? And I had always, from the time I was at Stockholm University doing my bachelor's in political science, um, expo was exposed to many political science theories about development, underdevelopment, and so on and so forth. And I was like, my education will be worthless if it doesn't really contribute to the development of my country. It was when I decided that no matter what, once I have the education I need, I'll go back to the Gambia to but work. Knowing, knowing the regime that was in place. Exactly. So yeah. I had to make a choice as to if I go, how would I make an impact? And I knew that at some point this regime will, will go, as all regimes will go. But we, for me, I wasn't thinking of the regime at that time. I was saying, how do we prepare Gambia for post Jame. Okay. How do we prepare our young minds to get ready for national development when, when this regime is gone? And for me, I had many options when I came back. I could have gone to work in many of the different ministries. Or, but no, I was like, the best place mm -hmm. to really shape minds and prepare Gambia for the task ahead is at the university. Because I was also aware of the great potential that the young people of the country has. Okay. And I was like, the only place to cone this potential to, to refine our young minds, to prepare them for nation building is at the university. So I decided that, well, I mean, if I'm going to contribute to Gambia, I'm going to share my knowledge. That is something that um, multiplies, that doesn't finish, it is infinite. Mm -hmm. The more knowledge I give, the more knowledge I gain. So it was when I decided that, okay, the university is the best place now, considering the circumstances. And I applied to, to be employed as a lecturer and now got accepted. On political science? Yes, political science department. And then I came, it was difficult at the beginning, after living in Europe for 16, 17 years, coming to the Gambia to stay, to try to adapt. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I remember there was a time that uh, it was very difficult for uh, lecturers, you know, to take up that political science, you know, at the university yes. because of fear exactly. you know, of the regime. Mm -hmm. But despite all odds, you know, you came and then 
Yes, we had a political science department, which was, we had only two lecturers there at that time. It was Fred Ozo, a Nigerian, and Dr. Sajatal. I came to join them, but, uh, you know, political science is a broad discipline. There are many different modules within the discipline of political science. Yeah. But there are certain modules that are considered to be um, very, very tricky and very dangerous to teach. For example, contemporary Gambian politics at that time, Nobody was teaching it. It was yeah. established since 2006, but nobody was teaching it. So yeah. when I came, the dean, Professor Gomez, told me, well, we have a course here. It's a 400 level course. Students want to graduate, but nobody wants to teach it. I said, well, I'll teach it. He said, are you sure? I said, yes, I'll teach it. So I started taking the course. I remember, um, and for me, the first syllabus I disseminated to the students, mm -hmm. a few students dropped out. In fact, one who was very caring called me at night to say, I remember how she's still working at the university. That I want you to drop this course because the, wow. the module you're giving us, this could be tantamount to sedition. You could handle yourself in trouble. Because I was using material from the Birmingham School of Gambian scholars. Okay. Um, the um, people like uh, Best and, and people like uh, Arnold Hughes and so on and so forth. And, and these guys were really damning in the assessment of the Jame, Jame era. Okay. I was using materials called, for example, there's a particular material I remember sharing in class and then students were really worried. It was called Gambia Fear Rules. It was an okay. Amnesty International um, publication that really um, talked about or highlighted some of the human rights abuses that were happening at that time. So, and most of these materials were considered seditious at that time. I knew my life was in danger. Sometimes I'd be very, very careful. So, and so I you have no fear? Not really, because I believed in academic independence. I believe that's what they call academic, uh, we, uh, you see, in as much as that's what they call diplomatic immunity, when diplomats have certain immunity yeah. based on old age traditions and norms. We academics also have what they call academic freedom. That is, we are free to exercise our work within, okay. um, within the domain of academia. Yes, there was some fear, because I was the only one who was organizing, sem I've organized a lot of seminars at the uni within the university campus. Um, seminars on interrogating damage, human rights, abuses, corruption. Some of the, and in fact, at some point, you realize that some of my colleagues were dissociating themselves from me because they thought I was, I was a risk taker. Yeah, and I was getting warning even from top officials from the university that be careful what you are doing. And I remember one particular occasion on the, it was an African Liberation Day, mm -hmm. uh, May 25th. I organized, um, together with other civil society organizations, Madi Jobat and others, a, a symposium at the university where we invited Dr. Skatri Jane. Yeah. At that time, he was not in government anymore. And he came and gave a damning indictment of the Jame regime. And some NIA officers were there. Two days later, he was arrested. Uh, that was when he was arrested for sharing those T-shirts, oh. Coalition for Change exactly. So obviously, we were working in an environment that was tricky. But I think the government also, they were not, they were not very ignorant. Ignor okay. um, I think Jame and uh, whoever who were advising him, security was were telling him, look, I mean, Jame's main preoccupation was his regime survival. Yeah. So he will react to anything that will threaten his regime, his, that survival. Mm -hmm. So he made that assessment, perhaps, I'm just speculating, okay. this okay. hypothesis I'm yeah. making. I said, perhaps, he might say, look, these guys are at the university, within the walls of the university, exercising academic freedom, as long as it's not out in the press, as long as it's not out outside <laughs> the walls of the university, exactly. it does no harm. Yeah. I think it was more dangerous for him to clamp down the university because of think of the repercussions, the repercussions that would create that, exactly. in terms of the protest student protest you don't want to incur the wrath okay. of students so obviously perhaps that made the calculation look no harm it's within the university let them go ahead and do what so they are you've, doing. you've you've never got warning you know from the nias oh or no, from no, general regime no in fact yeah. i had nias in my class that time introduction to police was full of nias some of them really enjoyed the course wow. and they'll come <laughs> to even like me and befriend me and tell me well we are nia but you know what you are doing what you are supposed to do. You are teaching, you are a lecturer. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they liked it and they enjoyed it. But, but we were not kind of, so we, at that time, maybe was out of Sherlock or whatever, but I knew that even though we were engaged in activities that were exposing um, yeah, Jame and his regime and his way of governance, but we were not arrested at once. And one of our colleagues was arrested, of course, Sid Matija, um, when he wanted to do some research to understand Gambian's perception of Jame regime. But that went outside of the university because questionnaires were shared yeah. outside of the university. But I think Jame knew that within the university, it's then you, don't, you don't touch the university without repercussions. Mm -hmm. That is why I remember one incident when university students came out to strike that um, against a particular grading system which was introduced and they came out to strike along the MDI road. Yeah. The whole government panicked. The 
by education minister, interior minister, all of them rushed to say, tell the students, well, let's go and discuss this. And they were divided into the university. And they were appeased. Um, and the following day, what did the president do? Somebody was sacrificed. He sacked yeah. Professor Ka from the university. So he knew yeah. how uh, dangerous it could be if he really touches that domain at the university. I think that's why we, some of us really escaped on scholarship. But, uh, how was it like with your family? Because I know that they must have knew that you were teaching you know, um, political science and then um, your life might be in danger. Um, how was it? Yeah, I mean, family, yes. Um, my mom was always telling me to be careful because I was very outspoken vocal. When I sit in the home, I talk about stuff about Jame, um, just without even being careful of what I'm saying. They'll say be careful, but overall, I mean, they, they knew I was doing my work and it comes with consequences. It's a decision I made. And we make decisions, and we, make, we have to also be uh, cognizant of the consequence of the decisions. And it was something I was ready to do for my country. And if at that time I was supposed I was to be sacrificed for the country, I was ready to do it. Because at that time, everybody was using their own platforms mm -hmm. to expose Jame. Imam Bavali was using his pulpit yeah. at the mosque. The, the pastors were using the pulpits in the, in the churches to... Uh, our, the media were using their platform, the newspapers, to, to, to expose. We were using the classroom to expose. But then again, s <laughs> there was a clampdown on the imams, a clampdown on the newspapers. Mm -hmm. But the university, I think, he just thought, it's nothing to worry about. They're not a threat to my existence. Because whatever they say remains within the university. It's not going out. Okay. Okay. So um, coming to the new government, um, when there was change, there was democracy. And then everybody thought that, uh, you know, there's freedom of speech. And then um, we woke up one day, Dr. Ismail Assisi was arrested because of what he said against the government on security issues. Yes, I mean, obviously, there was change. Um, like it is extraordinary moments mm. uh, require extraordinary measures. The country was governed for 22 years by a dictator um, with an iron fist. Um, he w everything he says was policy. He decides. In fact, he said it that this is my country. If you don't like it, leave. Like leave yeah. And nothing was happening. And there were several attempts to remove him, both constitutionally and unconstitutionally. Constitution, obviously, through elections, yeah. which he always won in one way or the other. Some will say to intimidation, some will say to electoral fraud. Well, and then there are also unconstitutional attempts. Several of them um, attempted coups. December 30. You name it, do charm, yeah. you name it. Attempts were made for 22 years. And at some point, he got so complacent that he said he can't rule for a billion years yeah. and that nobody could remove him from power. 2016 was a period when Gambians really realized that we have to do something. This is a turning point for Gambia. It is this or never. And at that time, the opposition leaders came to realize the role they have to play. And they came together to cobble um, um, a coalition together for the very first time after many attempts that has failed. And then they agreed on certain general principles, which made, it, which made the coalition attractive for other parties to live what they are doing to come and join the coalition. I remember Asadu Njai, Asadu, Dr. Asadu Tito came in very late, because he has, he had, she was even on the campaign trail when she was called to come and join the coalition. Then elections came, not many people expected not, yeah. that Jame would be defeated. Even most political analysts who follow and understand African politics, especially the door of dictators, we knew that if it comes to clean pools, because we, I did a polling um, exercise at the university um, just a couple of weeks before the elections, and I shared a questionnaire to ask students, will you vote, who will you vote for? And overwhelmingly, the majority were going to vote for the coalition on Adam Abaro. So we knew that there were indications that if it's clean, fair pools, he was going. Jame was going, because the coalition would, was no match for him. And then Mama Kanda had also breaking out, taking some, Jam, some of Jame's voters. But we knew that based on, obviously, the African politics literature, the dictators don't preside over elections exactly. that they lose. Yeah. That at some point, Jame would manipulate, even if it means that on the eve of the elections, that he would cancel the votes if he knew, for sure, that he would lose. But um, obviously, we are still thinking, how is it possible? How can Jame, after 23 years, with all this power he has amassed, with so, this so much entrenchment, how can we easily lose an election like that and accept defeat? <coughs> nobody was expecting nobody it. Expected, it was just like yeah. end of the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 18. And nobody was expecting it on the eve of that, 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 that tremendous moment in world history. So then he lost. People were still wondering, okay, he lost. Because the results were on the spot counting. Yeah. Everybody knew that he was losing. But, he might but the him. fact that mm -hmm. he considered defeat, that was a shock to the whole world. That was a big shock. Nobody was expecting that. Not even Jame himself. On that very morning when he woke up, 
he wasn't expecting that that evening he was going to call President Adam Abaro and concede defeat. He conceded defeat. Well, we said, okay, let's see. Some of us were still saying, well, let's still have the champagne on ice. Let's not celebrate yet. He's still, a, <laughs> he's still an erratic dictator. We'll yeah. see what happens. Then seven days later, he, he changed. He changed his mind. He took a U-turn. That did not surprise many, especially those who knew him. But again, the Gambia has been a country called the defiant nation. We've defied many odds since independence. Yeah. Before independence, many people thought that we could not survive as an independent state. Um, some calling it the birth of an improbable nation. Some saying you cannot, you are too small, no resources, you cannot survive um, in this complex world. Uh, therefore, you must find solutions. The Malta solution, the Sierra Leone Federation solution, the Senegambian uh, Federation solution. No, no, we said we will survive. We survived against all odds. Jawara really and his colleagues made sure that we survived. In 1970, there was a referendum. We became a republic. In 81, we were tested again to a coup d'etat by Kukwesa Kukwesa Kukwesa. Kukwesa. A small nation we are with no army. We are tested. We survive. The confederation ended in 89. Senegalese withdrew all their troops, leaving us exposed, vulnerable. We made it. In 94, again, there was a coup. Of all the odds in 22 degrees, so the Gamba is the defied nation. So we knew we were going to, we, we, we defied. We, we defied moments. We defied times. We defied um, um, challenges. But this time, we defied a dictator. When he said no, we were the first at the university, a couple of week, hours later, to denounce yeah. that, no, no, that. you yeah. and your criminal government have to go because it, you, are t you are violating and selling the will of the Gambian people. We have voted to say you must go, and if accepted, you must go, otherwise we boycott all lectures. And that created star, and that emboldened the whole population to say we can defy. Yeah, we then can. Monday, we did that on Saturday, on Monday, Bar Association also Put an, um, kind of put an, gave, us, gave us traction. Yeah. Then every day people are coming out and that defied, and then that also made ECOWAS and the UN to know, look, you know what, Gam we have support from within. We can also put pressure from outside to make sure it goes. Um, obviously, preventive diplomacy was first used by bringing in presidents to reason with Jamie, to, to tell him to leave. Him, yeah. um, he refused, and then when preventive diplomacy failed, then there was uh, an operation, uh, a UN resolution called Operation Restore Democracy by all necessary means, not ruling out the use of force, force. military force. And when that happened, the Jamie new game was over, and he had to concede and leave the country. Then a new government wa was ushered in, a new hope, yeah. um, a new era for Gambia um, that we've been yearning for, that we've all fought for. Mm, the new government came with slogans, freedom, you know, human rights, um, now you can rule of law, mm -hmm. uh, we are going to um, repeal the Public Order Act, now you are, this government is a democratic country. So the c population was uh, made to understand that this is a new era, it's a new era um, and, and, and the population could easily shift from democratic mode very quickly to uh, from dictatorial to mode to, 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 to democracy, democracy. Yeah. and we shifted, but the state it, it's still taking a, lot, a long time for the state to adapt to these new realities. That is why they are still reacting whenever the population demand and exercise their democratic rights. The state responds uh, as if we are in a dictator. So when that happened, we, uh, um, we obviously that brought in this ECOWAS forces. Mm. It was a supposed to be a short-term stabilization force to stabilize and then leave. But for one reason or the other, perhaps based on security prudence, it was advised that they should stay longer. But for me, I made observations because mm. I do a lot of security studies and I do a research, a research on security, especially within the African region. And I observe that the long-term stability of the Gambia would not be ensured if economic is still, still around, around, and that we should try to find an exit strategy for economic, that they should be here for the short term. See how we can quickly reorientate our security See. apparatus to understand that they should service democracy and become democ as quickly as possible, even though it's a long term process. Mm -hmm. But the process must start now, and that um, economic should be relieved and go back so the security is handled by our own men. How do we do that? And I observed at that time by talking to so many security officers around the country that they felt that the current government had no confidence in them. Okay. And my advice was the President Barrow should, how do we, how does he do that? He must first ensure that he has the confidence of the army. How? By making sure that he engages them. How do you engage them constructively? Go visit their barracks. Um, you are the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. 
go to Yundumba, accent, speak to them. How are you guys living? What's happening? Okay, that alone, that alone makes the motivate the army to say, "Wow, yeah. we have a president who really cares about us." No matter how loyal they are to President Gambia, mm. people's loyalties can change depending on circumstances. Mm. They'll, you know, they'll understand that Gambia comes first, and that was the advice I gave for me. And when I was saying that, I wasn't thinking of. You see, security is co very complex. Um, uh, it's a very complex phenomenon, okay. in the sense that it has been broadened and deepened over the past years, especially after the end of the Cold War by the so-called uh, Copenhagen School. Now, before, during the Cold War, security was thought of only within the micro, uh, within the myopic lens of state security and military security. Okay. That is, the referent object of security was the state. Uh, that when the state was secure, the people are secure. When the Cold War ended, um, the Copenhagen School came up with a new thinking of security. That security goes beyond only the state as the reference okay. object of security. It has been broadened in the sense that it includes economic security, human security, environmental security, mm. you name it. And uh, it has also been deepened in the sense the reference object is not the state anymore. Mm. It, the state is still a reference object, yes, but also human beings human are reference objects. Are so objects. when I was warning about security, I wasn't just focusing on security of the state. Okay. That is why the question, all the questions were state security. I was thinking of human security, human economic okay. security. I was thinking of this day, last two Wednesdays ago, when um, youth came out to born child. That, yeah. that was my thinking, that if you don't give the people, if people are not secure, uh, if they're deprived of certain basic um, necessities, they could revolt against the state. And I was thinking along those lines that even economy cannot stop that. No matter how many economic troops you have been, look at what happened. Mm -hmm. the yeah. student, youths came out to bone tires to, to do things. What can economic do about that? So what my thinking was, the way security has changed, our understanding must focus on that and provide a security infrastructure that can respond to these new security threats, environmental, economic, and, and so on and so forth. But then I was arrested, and then I was interrogated for four hours. I was put in a cell, I was charged for inciting <laughs> violence, violence, which for me was a farce. Okay. So, uh, were you surprised? I was when very surprised. When you were arrested? Of course, I was, it was, I mean, it was, I was very surprised because I was, in fact, I didn't even know what it was about. I had made that interview three weeks ago, mm. one of those innocuous interviews. I didn't even think that it was, it was going to raise such so, okay. uh, a reaction. Yeah. And I was just called to say, you are wanted at the police station for an interview. I was like, okay, I didn't do any interview, what's it about? I said, maybe that's a mistake, let me just go. When I went, they gave me the newspaper, and I just laughed. I said, is this why you are calling me here? They said, yes. Well, I said, well, prepare a room for me here. If this is why, then I'll be coming here every day, because I'll not, these are expert, I'm an expert analyst on these issues. I cannot keep quiet on these issues. I think if you want to engage me to understand the reasoning behind this, we can do it. But, but their question was, which they emphasized, especially the person they sent in from the office of the president to interrogate me further was, you don't. You never worked as a security officer. Why do you comment on security issues? Because you are a political scientist. Okay. As a political scientist, it's a broad subject. Um, it, it's a broad discipline which encompasses economic security and international relations, international uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, and I also do a few a lot of research on security issues. So I, have a max, I think I can speak on these issues. And funnily enough, what I've predicted is what has come to pass. That. We have security challenges that economic can do nothing about, okay. no matter what. And also, their long-term presence also can also kind of create discord within our security forces, because our men want to serve this mm -hmm. country. Our men want to be given the chance to serve this country. Having foreign forces here in the long term, anywhere in the world you go, is not advisable. And the EU ambassador just came out the other day to say that, the same thing I said. Mm -hmm. So obviously, these are things that happen, and um, that in New Gambia, people will be arrested for speaking their mind. Mm -hmm. That was something that we least expected. Okay, um, so f um, since then we've seen um, there have been, you know, like uh, words being thrown out. Okay, um, you know, so many people saying, "Who is Dr. Ismail?" Is to question Gambian security, this and that. We've also seen, you know, um, some of your interviews. Um, you've been very critical, you know, um, of the current government, uh, which even prompted the president, you know, um, to be angry you know, respond, where were you? I haven't been critical, yes, you might say critical, but it depends, that this is, it depends on what you might critical. I'm just a citizen who was speaking, his, who was observing the status quo. That's my job. Yeah. And telling the government that what is happening. Sometimes the media also sensationalizes it. For example, I remember one particular interview I did with The Voice. Yeah. 
and I said that uh, what was the headline they put there that President Barrow I can't remember but my whole advice was that the president must understand the purpose of the transition and he must not deviate from that uh, purpose mm -hmm. he must ensure that he focuses on the transition if he wants to be a success if he wants to leave a good legacy but sometimes you the media guys will put a headline <laughs> just to sell papers right, and many yeah. people don't read the news they just see the they headline and the they start yeah. and also our debate should go beyond emotional emotions yeah. that okay who said it? it's not about who said it let's just listen to what he said scrutinize it debate it i mean i'm not saying that i've I know everything or I'm always right. Sometimes I can get it wrong. Sometimes on, uh, my opinions are not always the best opinion, but I have my opinion. I have a right to voice my opinion. You have a right to also challenge my opinion in a, in a mature manner, which debate, that's, debate, that's what make, moves the country, national de public debates. It's very, very important in a country. A country cannot move if the space is not there for, for public, or are just mistakes we'll be making. So for me, my point of view was, I have a right to sound my opinion. If you want, don't agree with me. Let's have a debate on it. It creates a national debate. Yeah. For example, when I made the um, assertion that uh, the currently constitution says you should get only secondary school education to be president, I said perhaps we'd go beyond that because the global, uh, you know, multilateral politics globally has changed. Governance has changed in the 21st century. That perhaps grade 12 is not enough. Maybe we should think of raising the bar. And some people are saying, I was, I was yeah, saying that if I'm not educated, yeah. not. I mean, sometimes yeah. they twist it. And that was my, my purpose was to have a debate on that. Do we need it? Okay. And now what happened was that the CRC will tell you. When they went around the country for consulting, many people are saying that you should get a degree to be president. So for me, it was just to create, ignite a debate, a national discourse. So we can discuss it. And then I bring my opinion, you bring your opinion. Okay. And then we, we, you, you know, we pit, you know, that's, we, you know, that's what they call the Socratic method. Huh? My, my thesis against okay. your antithesis and that leads to a higher thesis called the synthesis. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is how societies develop. So we get, we get the best, best decision, we decision makers, we inform them. I have nothing against the government. I have nothing against the president. In fact, I was one of the first people who, when he was at Karaba um, during the impasse, the first, one of the first people who, took, who organized a conference at the University of the Gambia during the, when the impasse just started, that we came up with a resolution with young people that by hook or by crook, Baro will be inaugurated on the 18th. Then even ECOMI had not even threatened the use of force. After that m conference, we drove straight to President Baro at Karaba, at Karaba Hotel. We are followed by the NIA. Um, Kimo Bojang is a youth counselor. He's my witness, he was with us. We went to President Baro. I introduced all the young people to him. I told him, look, Mr. President, you are president. Um, by hook or by crook, we have made a resolution that we will die, but you'll be you know, greater than the 18th. And he was like, well, this is our country. And I said, well, we are not politicians. We are experts in our whole field. This is New Gambia. Everybody should come together to work. That whenever you need our advice and our services, we're not looking for a job. We're not interested in a job in government. We are very satisfied with where we are. But if you need our services, advice or whatever, our doors are always open at the university. And we have other people at the university who will be willing to help. But then again, when they when came into power and then we started seeing things that they didn't like, they thought we were enemies. And that's not how you, that's not how a leader does. Engage those who are critical. If you listen to them more. Many people, many people thought that, okay, uh, you're looking for popularity. That's why, you know, uh, you're challenging this borough government in order for you to, you know, enter politics. Yeah, but if I, I'm a, okay, if I was looking for popularity and if I was looking for a way to enter politics, I would get. I would go and dogo dogo baro. I'll praise him all over. He'll make me minister. It's easy to be popular and it's a minister than a critic. A cri I mean, if I was a I mean, nobody will insult me. Nobody will say, and I'll become popular, and I'll also get access to power, and I'll, that will even help me position myself to 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 to, to, to be president because already I'll, I'll use that as, a, as as an experience. I wouldn't take the more difficult route to be considered a pariah, to be insulted every day because you have a different opinion. I wouldn't do that. I would praise Baro. I'll tell him, you are the best president Gambia has ever had. He'll make me minister, he'll, make me, he'll give me a very good position. I'm qualified, so he'll do it. That's easier for me okay. than to... <laughs> so for me, that does it. that's not logical okay. to say that you're looking for popular. Popularity for what? Are Is you, popular are so you what? into politics now? I'm not. I'm still a mm -hmm. political science lecturer at the University of the Gambia. The last time I checked my CV... There's, no, was association, there's no political association that you are on the verge of you know, creating? Um, I mean, 
<laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how, how, how things unfold. Mm -hmm. We'll see how things unfold. Because there are rumors of new citizens, I don't know what. Well, you said it's rumors, so rumors are just yeah. rumors. The <laughs> amount of rumors we produce in this country a day is yeah. in the tons. If, we, if they can be converted into dollars, we'll be very rich. We'll not even care about our oil. So, so rumors are so rumors. So 2020, you, you're, not 2020, you're not thinking of... 2020, you're not thinking of, you know... 2020 is about two and a half, two, yeah. two years. Two years is a long time in politics. Things mm -hmm. can change. But when they change, you'll know. Yeah. So we can assume that um, you may be into politics. Well, that decision is not left to me. That decision is left to many factors. As we approach, it depends. If the country, if you realize that the country, you should serve the country. When I came to serve the country at that time, I knew the university was the best place. Okay. If times change and I know that me entering into politics will help serve the country better, there's no doubt about that. But until then, we'll see how things evolve. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's look at the current political situation in the country. Um, how will you um, evaluate it right now? And then what is your uh, view on this issue of three years? And five, five years. years yeah. The current situation, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something. Um, we have to understand that, see, some, let's be open-minded as citizens and understand things from a broader perspective. We've gone through a very difficult period as a country. That is why I said the defiant nation. We've defied in this country. Now, when dictatorship ended, there was first, we thought we were going to be have an easy transition, even though we are lucky okay. as a country. Many countries had to go undergo war, civil war, yeah. to transit from one era to the other. For us, by virtue of many prayers that our elders are doing in this country, it was an impasse, a short one for that matter, but a very tense one for that matter. We didn't start well. Now, a, the tr always a transition from dictatorship that has been entrenched to democracy is always fraught. It's always a fraught business. It's very difficult. Um, and the situation is still fragile, still. We are a very young democracy, recently midwifed yeah. by the coalition partners. Kim young, very weak, anemic, and then it must be treated with care because it's, uh, it did not come out in the best of ways. It did not come out through normal labor. It was, you know, uh, it, it was very complex. Very complex yeah. Now, yet we want to do so many things. Why? Because there are many expectations when the new government came to power. They did not help in managing those expectations. They made many promises. We'll do X, Y, Z, X, just as in many politicians. Yeah. They raised the expectations of the citizens. And the most dangerous thing you can do is raise the expectations of citizens to a particular level, to the peak. If those expectations are not met in a gradual way, it's okay. But if it if all of a sudden changes, it, it, you know, it, it did not materialize very quickly, yeah. it can really cause anger in the population. That is one thing. The second thing is we have to do a lot of reforms because many things went wrong in this country. We want to ensure that never again those things go wrong. The TRRC, the Constitutional Review Pro Commission, security sector reform. So all these reforms are taking place at the same time as these expectations by the citizens who feel that now they have a right to demand certain democratic rights. At the same time, a country polarized politically along ethno-political lines, whereby divisions even within the coalition itself. Yeah. So all these things are happening at the same time. It's very difficult for any country to go through that. And I think people should understand that. See, multiple layers of reforms, the coalition that is uh, uh, the country ethno-politically polarized. And, and so many things happening, and high expectations that expectations are not met. So many things are happening at the same time. Therefore, it is difficult for any president. But we have to understand that President Barrow is just the president. Mm. And presidents come and go. But the Gambia remains. Gambia remains yeah. So whatever we do as citizens, we must ensure we help Gambia and not help borrow or whatever. So whatever you do will have an impact on, impact on the Gambia. And I think that is one thing we should understand. That is why I refuse, to be, I refuse to be forced to make a choice between this binary of three or five years. Three or five years. For me, I don't want to be boxed. Yeah, yeah, because I wanted to ask you. Yes, I don't want yeah. to be boxed into three or five. For me, I'm looking at the broader picture. Mm -hmm. you see, let's look at the national interest. Obviously, yes, I agree that 
A man has nothing but his words, and your words are your honor. If you make a promise, you must ensure that no matter how difficult it is, you fulfill that promise. But and if you cannot, there's a way you also handle it. If I make a promise to you and say, accompany me to turn table and I'll give you five hundred dollars, you trust me. Yeah. Because you think I'm a man of integrity and I'll fulfill my promise. We went to turn table and I said, You asked me your money, and I said, Well go to the police. It's not a crime to make a promise. That's deceit. I've been very deceptive. And that's not setting a good example. It's not setting a good example for our democracy and also even for politics in general because once we start to condone these kind of things, people will think that, well, what we talk about politicians is true. true. They are decept deceptors and we don't want that. Also, it's sending a bad signal to the younger generation that it is good to make a promise and fail and it fail. and it's okay. To avoid that situation, for the president to have his integrity intact when he leaves office at any time, if he cannot really fulfill the promise he made with the coalition partners. It is very ap appropriate for him to go back and tell them, let's have a seat and That's look at the country. Okay. That when we were making this promise, we didn't expect to win elections, let alone have a smooth transition. But we won. But the transition was not smooth. It started with an impasse, which delayed us a bit. All these reforms to be done, I cannot do all these things within three, within years, three years. Because the spirit of the MOU was that there was going to be a brand new constitution before the three years end so that there'll be a clause in the constitution which could call for fresh elections but this all these things didn't happen and the coalition also had a role to, uh, a responsibility in the sense that when they won the elections they never met to discuss the way forward mm -hmm. that we've won let's how do we move on they did not they are busy with politicking and doing stuff that we don't understand so all of them have to blame not that has happened no blame game because it won't solve the problem. The president should have the, the, the courage to go back to the coalition partners, to go back to the country because he promised the country as well. He went around the country touring, saying that when he wins, he'll serve for three years. Many people voted because of the attractiveness mm -hmm. of the coalition agenda. Let him go back to the coalition partners. Go back to the people, speak to them. Say, look, this is the situation. This is how complex the situation. This is how difficult it is. This is what I inherited. This is my intention for the country. But I cannot do this within three years. It won't change anything. See how you can negotiate. And then we'll have a national discourse about this. We'll have consensus as a country and we'll move on. Okay. Whether he decides to resign, if he's in the best interest of the country, or we decide, or the country say, well, you know what, finish your five-year term and we'll see what happens for the interest of the country. But having that confrontational attitude to say whether you like it or not, that wouldn't solve the problem. Okay. But at the same time as well, I'm not stopping anybody from exercising your democratic rights to process. I'm not saying that they should not do it, but we should also think of protesting to force a president out. Will it solve our problem? Mm. Will it change our circumstances? Will it make our reform successful? What kind of president will it start? You see, democracy in a country is a very, very complex business. Senegal today is enjoying democracy because the culture was injected into the polity from the beginning by Leopold Sedar Senghor, who relinquished power voluntarily. That is why today Senegal has that culture continuing. Mm -hmm. In Guinea-Bissau, how many governments finished their term? You can count it. Why? Mm -hmm. Because governments were not allowed to finish and they are overturned. That culture continued. Now in the Gambia, we've had a culture of having leaders who self perpetuate Jawara for 30 years, Jame for 22 years. Now, we want to avoid that, to inject a new culture into our polity. The idea was we have a president who will serve for three years and voluntarily resigns. That will reset our democratic culture into a mode which is that now we have leaders who can really relinquish power voluntarily even when they lose elections. Because this is the first time that has happened. Now, if we go out in the, I'm not saying nobody should go. That's the right to exercise. I'm just making an analysis. If we force Barrow out in 2019 January, so what? Who will come to replace him? What arrangements are there? How, how, will, how will things happen? We know we aren't ready for elections in 2019. So we don't want to also start having presidents. People riot, they step down, yeah, somebody, step down. Comes, somebody comes. Three, four months down the line, well, you are running very badly, people come in. That also, we should also think about those things and think of the security of this country. Okay. So I think now, for me, I'm not in three years. I'm not in, I'm not in, I don't want to be put in that box, okay. that binary. Okay. I want to look at the broader interest of the Gambia. 
What is the interest of the gap? And how do I want to make that approach? I want us to have a national dialogue. Let's talk as a country. UDP, DOI, PPP, Bajame, sorry, Baro. Let us come, let's forget our politics first. That can come later. Let us sail through easily through this transition, which is very weak and very fragile, and which is like a, a boat, a, a ship at sea that is going through very rough weather. And we need leadership to navigate us through this very complex and difficult um, condition. And this leadership doesn't, cannot be provided by only one person. Okay. All of us should come together, media, religious leaders, academia, politicians. Let us see, because December, what's happening now is yeah. the cloud of uncertainty in our country. We don't know what's going to happen in December. December exactly. Will there be protests or not? Will he be forced out or not? If he's forced out, what's going to happen? What are the arrangements? You know, is there going to be another impasse? Is there going to be another military intervention? We don't know what's going to happen. And that's not good for the country in the, in the short, in the medium, and in the long term. What's going to lead these investors will have less confidence to invest in the long term in this country. They'll know, well, what's going to happen in December? Tourists will not book tourists, their flights yeah, exactly. because they'll the say, well, what's going to happen? There'll be capital flights. Yeah. Indians and Lebanese control our businesses. They'll yeah. start sending their money back to say, we don't know what's going to happen. So to avoid that situation that the country knows now what's going to happen, it's time. I've made this two years ago that that was the time, but it's not seen it. That let Barrow take the lead. He's the leader. Let him engage his colleagues. I know they are very reasonable people and they see the interest of it. That is why they came first and agreed on the coalition. Mm -hmm. When he speaks to them, they'll understand, speaks to the government, let's have a national debate. Okay. But then, for me, that's, like I said, I'm not going to be boxed in three or five. Okay. So, he, so, so um, if you are called upon by Barrow giving a position, uh, will you take it? And have you been approached? What do you mean by position? If, if ministerial position or any other no, I mean, uh, you see, that, the that thing that is, we can serve given. our country. And have you been approached also? Well, I wouldn't delve into that. Um, I wouldn't talk about things that have been discussed privately, of course. But what I'm saying is that... But you've been approached? Um, I, will, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't answer that question. Why? Because that's a private issue. <laughs> <laughs> that's not for the public uh, domain. If, I'm, if I was or not. Mm. Uh, that's, for me, that's not the, the issue. The issue is, we can serve our country in different ways. Do yeah. you get my point? Um, I think now the job, the work I'm doing at the university, for now, it's doing a very good job there. I have many students who are passing through me, and we are preparing them. Um, me going, being a minister, will I serve the Gambia better? Maybe not. Maybe for now, the role, maybe for now, I'm supposed to be at the university. But I wouldn't rule out helping this government. It's not about President Barrow. Yeah. Because if Gambia fails, we all fail. if we sabotage the president and he fails and Gambia fails, he can easily leave and go and live an exile in exile somewhere else and live a very comfortable life. It is us that will fail in this country. I'm not, I, I mean, right now, I don't want any ministerial position, if I'm going to make that clear to you. I'm not interested in any job in government. I'm comfortable at the university, but we can still help in many different ways. We can give advice. We can, uh, we can um, tell them, like, look, X, Y, Z, do X, Y, Z, and you'll, you'll succeed. We, ca we can do that for free. We don't need to be paid for that. that is because it's our country. And in fact... Uh, finally, um, what's your message to Gambian youths and then to the coalition partners? For, Gam for the coalition partners, this is a time in our country when our country needs leadership. Um, and they are the political leaders of this country. They should put their differences, their egos aside. The Gambia is bigger than all of them, all of us. Let them come together now. This country needs them. They, but in this transition, they should not let it feel like that into, into chaos. Yes, there are political differences, but history will be told and retold. In 150 years' time, our kids will read our history. They'll talk about the good things, how they came together to salvage a country from degradation, but how they could not manage to really uh, gain, uh, to, to reap the gains uh, of, 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 that, of that very good job. So I think they should come together, put their egos and political difference aside. Politics will come, yes, we'll go, there'll be polling, there'll be campaigning, there'll be election. But for now, the country is going through very turbulent times and it needs everybody to be part of this big project to salvage this country. For the youths, the country is yours. Maintain the peace no matter what you do. Um, peace is nego non-negotiable, and now the country is fragile. You can you can see the country is peaceful on the surface, but the undercurrents are things that many people don't see. The tectonic shifts that are happening under, 
um, can, and it can happen very quickly and ignite the country. And young people have a key role to play in this. I know the young people of the Gambia. They are very passionate about this country. They have the drive. They have the energy. They want the country to move. They don't want to take the back way to go to Europe. They want to live in dignity into their own countries. And they want it quickly. They have the energy to do it. What the government can do is to engage them, come up with a strategy. How do you engage the young people constructively to reorient this energy, this drive, this passion into something positive that can lead to uh, nation building? Invest in the young people. Know what they want, engage them. And then we can help move the country. But then again, I tell the young people, refrain from violence because it wouldn't pay. If, you born, if a country burns for 10 years, it takes 10 years, 20 years to put the fire off. Totally it takes another 50 years to, totally to reconstruct the country. And who's going to lose? It's them, because they have nowhere to go. They have to be forced to stay in this country. Let's maintain the calm. Let's maintain the peace. Let's engage constructively. Uh, let's always try before we go and protest, protest, protest. Let us first engage and exhaust all channels, channels okay. whereby we can solve our grievances and get what we want. Um, because it, it wouldn't pay. I mean, if you protest, so what? Is your problem solved? Perhaps not. Perhaps tires are born. Some of some your colleagues are put in, in detention. So what? Did you achieve what you really want? Perhaps no. So I think we should, the youth should really understand these issues and let them not be used by politicians um, for their own political interests. And finally, mm -hmm. one thing that we also un need to understand is that no matter how much you want to be president of this country, make sure that you don't burn, you don't do anything that will burn this country. Because okay. if you want to, if you inherit a country that is intact, it is easier for you to govern, govern. and inherit a country that has been burned already.